Good afternoon and welcome to COMP 422, COMP 620, Information, Privacy and Security. Today we're talking about election security and we have a guest speaker for today. Uh, we have Jason Green, who will be talking to us about his work in election security. He's a PhD student here at a and and just a minute while I fumble around with uh, Zoom and PowerPoint. Okay. Okay, there we go. And I'll have Mr. Green take over from here. Yeah, introduce awesome. yourself. Thank you. Um, yeah, guys. So um, my name is Jason Green. I'm a PhD student here. Also technically a student, just like you guys. So um, I I understand. I'll try to get you all out here a little early, um, but. I am a current PhD student in the Cybersecurity Research and Educational Outreach Center on campus. Um, Dr. Sarah Zeta is my advisor um, and runs the center. Um, my main focus is election security. And so that's what I'm gonna be talking to you all about today. Um, hopefully this is uh, engaging enough for you. Um, I find it a very timely topic um, and I'll try to kind of touch on a lot of stuff that you've probably heard about uh, in the news the past couple of years um, and how it all interconnects and uh, works. Um, so just to kind of go over what I'm going to be talking about, um, I'm going to talk about election security in general, how it's defined, um, what it is we're trying to protect, and then look at the threats and vulnerabilities uh, that are present. Um, and then talk about how manipulation and disruption uh, affects that process, uh, how we need to uh, secure polling places uh, physically, um, as well as ballot boxes, um, and the political environment that uh, determines how uh, that all can happen. Um, I'm also going to talk about the procedural integrity and election oversight of elections. This plays a huge part in uh, making sure elections are secure. Um, and then I'm going to go into some work we're actually doing at a and um, We're looking at two election management systems, Dominion and ESNS. Uh, you've probably heard uh, Dominion a lot. Uh, ESNS is actually a bigger company, um, but they have a lot of similarities in how they run their elections. Um, and then some preventative measures uh, that we're working on with HoneyNets, uh, as well as a couple other uh, novel research areas that we're looking to apply uh, to elections. And then I'm going to kind of show how it all links together um, and influences, it influences each other. Um, and then I'll wrap it up. Um, so to start, uh, election security, uh, I'm going to use the Department of Homeland Security's um, designation on this. So they designate election infrastructures, anything to do with voter databases, or the IT infrastructure and election management systems that surround that. So your election management system would be uh, the voting uh, machine that you interact with and everything that goes along with that. Um, any any kind of storage facilities um, and that uh, infrastructure and then the actual building that is housed in. Um, and they actually provide a really nice, um, uh, they call it a snapshot here of the different components. So what we need to secure in an election is the, the human element, the physical element, and the digital element. Um, so we need to make sure that the, the voters vote doesn't come back to haunt them. Um, we need to make sure that they can cast that vote uh, safely. Um, and we need to make sure that once that vote is cast, that uh, we manage it digitally in a way that keeps it secure. Um, and then they also kind of illustrate here the different places that are involved. So academia, uh, you know, we're doing research um, on election security, but uh, universities and schools are also one of the primary places that uh, voting happens. 
uh, local federal jurisdictions, uh, your police station, your uh, local courthouse. Uh, you know, we have to think about the security of those buildings um, and, and how we store voting machines in them. Um, yeah. As far as the threats we see, though, um, I've, I've designated it into four main areas. So your general cyber attacks. So um, the general cyber attacks, insider threats, supply chain attacks, and social engineering. So you're, you're, um, each of these interplay with each other, but all of these um, uh, have subcategories that I'm going to go into and address. Um, cyber attacks. So um, these are things that you probably have heard of and probably have seen. So denial of service, uh, phishing attacks, ransomware, data manipulation. Uh, these are all conventional cybersecurity uh, methods that can impact an election, election site, uh, the voter databases uh, surrounding those sites. Um, and uh, kind of as a comparison on the uh, side of the screen here, I have some of the vulnerabilities in the two election management systems that we have uh, looked at. Um, so uh, just to kind of give you a snapshot of what I'll be talking about later. Um, so for example, uh, data manipulation, um, how can that affect uh, the APIs or uh, any kind of risk of code injection, um, a uh, data manipulation attack or a man in the middle attack could have a direct impact on, on these vulnerabilities here. Um, and then insider threats. So uh, this is one of the hardest to quantify. Um, since 2020 election, one in three individuals that work at voting sites have been um, replaced or have left the position. Um, oftentimes there's people that uh, come in are more politically motivated, that's why they're there. Um, these people are really dangerous. Uh, it can be really dangerous if um, they have the right knowledge on how to um, affect uh, threats that are there. Um, coupled with this, uh, active election denying has become very prominent in the U.S. Over half of the 2022 ballot ran with an election denier. Um, there are now over 170 uh, open election deniers in Congress. Um, and the legislature across the country has shifted uh, to reflect this, um, making it easier for states to uh, become involved in uh, changing the outcomes of elections or having more control on uh, an outcome of an election. Um, Next, supply chain attacks. So uh, there's a lot of physical um, devices and systems that go into uh, running an election site. Um, a lot of those can be uh, categorized under an election management system, um, which I'll get to in a little bit. Uh, but issues like software vulnerabilities, attackers being able to insert malicious code into election software, um, hardware tampering, um, being able to uh, mess with the machine and, and transportation, um, third-party compromise of devices. Um, it, you know, there's a lot of common off-the-shelf devices that are uh, used in systems, um, just run-of-the-mill computers, printers. Uh, all of these come with vulnerabilities and um, can have their own uh, compromises in the supply chain leading up to an election. So, um, and then lastly, social engineering. So uh, over 80% of um, cybersecurity attacks or hacks start with social engineering, um, getting into systems, uh, compromising people that work in a, in a place uh, that is under attack. Uh, this doesn't change with uh, election sites. Um, unfortunately, uh, for social engineering and cybersecurity, a lot of the individuals that work at polling places uh, tend to be older individuals who are more susceptible to these types of attacks. Um, phishing attacks. Uh, attackers can send phishing emails or texts uh, to election officials to try to um, garner information or pretend to be somebody else, um, which is also known as pretexting. Uh, impersonation, um, whether that's another election official, uh, 
pretending to be a state official. Um, and yeah, I, all of it is targeted at how to get into an election site, gain admin privileges, uh, gain any kind of information that could potentially compromise an election site. Um, this is what Russia has done a lot of. Um, Russia is it, one of their primary methods on trying to attack a um, election site is with phishing, um, just sending emails, uh, trying to just pretend to be somebody else. Um, but it can be very effective. Um, next, manipulation and disruption. So this is, I'm, I'm gonna start to get into um, social uh, media um, and how misinformation propagates and impacts elections. Um, so I have this little graph here. Uh, I really like uh, how this illustrates how um, the erosion can slowly happen um, with social media and with misinformation and disinformation. And so I should specify there is a difference in that misinformation and disinformation. Um, they are different entities, but they um, they play into each other. And I'll get into that in the next slide. But essentially, when you add uh, false information, uh, it, the technical term would be malinformation um, into a system. Um, it leads to all kinds of uh, third party entities, people involved in the system to, um, uh, they can use that. Um, if, if people feel the system is broken, uh, there's less eyes on how an election is run. Um, this leads to pressure on the local election officials. Uh, we saw this a lot in uh, 2020. Um, and then because of the pressure on local elections, um, election deniers can get into office. Um, this is a direct result of the misinformation. Um, if people believe an election is rigged, um, it's much easier to have them vote for somebody uh, who uh, represents that belief. Um, and then those people get into office, they change laws. Uh, just like that uh, uh, previous slide, I talked about the massive amount of changes in legislature uh, that have occurred. Um, and then finally, that just ultimately leads to subversion of election results, um, which is simply the practice of denying an election, um, the election's results by just refusing to accept them. Um, and, and it all starts with misinformation and disinformation. So um, I have here in the red and the blue, uh, essentially the difference. Uh, one is intentional, the other is not. So um, some of you might've heard recently about the hospital attack in Gaza. Um, so this is a really good example of how misinformation and disinformation play into each other. Um, so when it happened, there was a lot of unintentional spread of false information, um, but Hamas seized on that opportunity you then start spreading disinformation actively to um, to further their campaign in that area. Um, and so there is a difference, but uh, they ultimately play into each other. Um, and, and this is really how uh, malinformation becomes weaponized is a lot of times it just starts from um, unintentional spread of uh, misinformation. Um, and, and that misinformation grows to be weaponized. Um, Russia, for example, uh, tends to start this, uh, in, in their social media campaigns, they started this on the intentional side. So they would intentionally make false news and then use bots to spread that as widely as they could to where people would unintentionally start spreading it for them. Um, this has a huge, uh, uh huge impact on elections. I have a list of, uh, impacts here. Um, I mean, the silos that people live in on social media, uh, this stuff just gets amplified. Um, again, like I said, in that erosion uh, circle, um, it just erodes trust in, in institutions running elections. Um, people don't turn out to vote because they believe the system is broken. Um, and, and it's just a breeding ground for foreign countries to come in and interfere with elections. Um, and that's why we've seen social media uh, so prominently in the news. Um, it's just that, that switch between misinformation and, uh, disinformation. Um, one of the 
uh, my favorite examples of this. Um, this was a uh, Facebook post that over 3 million people reposted uh, in 2015 that the Pope had endorsed Donald Trump for president. Uh, this was indeed false, um, but uh, it didn't matter because uh, the spread was so wide that it had an impact. Um, and, you know, ultimately, it's just it's manipulation of public opinion. Um, and, and this becomes weaponized in elections. Um, and it's, you know, so I have this quote at the bottom here um, that I think is really important post Cold War era. Um, because, uh, and this is uh, former Soviet Prime Minister uh, Nikita Khrushchev. Uh, he said, We will be able to take America without firing a shot. We do not have to invade the U.S. We will simply destroy it from within. And this is the narrative that is driving Russia right now um, to do what they're doing in trying to subvert our elections. Um, they don't need to invade the U.S. Uh, they can simply use uh, stuff that we already have here. Um, China is doing a very similar thing with TikTok. Um, China doesn't allow uh, TikTok in their own country uh, because they realize like, how strong the weaponization of this is in changing a country's minds. Uh, once you have the minds of the people, um, I mean, it's all downhill from there. Um, and so uh, this brings me to election subversion. Like I said, this is the process of denying an election uh, by just not accepting the results. Um, in uh, the US, uh, we have seen this most prominently in uh, January 6th. Um, but what's, what's very fascinating about this is, um, you see it happening. Uh, you, you can't do this, uh, behind closed doors. You have to openly go out, uh, and, and spread false information. Um, you have to, to spread a false narrative. Um, and, and the system has to be broken enough that people can believe it. Um, which is, is the state of our elections right now. Um, is is there complicated enough and there's enough areas that uh, people can point to uh, with questions that it becomes really easy to drive a narrative that um, uh, drive the narrative of election subversion. Um, and again, I have it here at the top, like one of the most pr uh, fundamental parts of elections is proving to the person that has won and has lost that they have indeed won and lost that election. Um, and if you can't do that, it doesn't matter how secure your election is or not, uh, your election is unsecure uh, because you, um, if somebody is able to drive the narrative, uh, like we've seen here in the U.S., that an election has been stolen or not been stolen um, as researchers and, and as professionals in election security, we have failed. Um, and and that's, that's the simple nature of, of election subversion. Uh, it plays on on that erosion cycle to the point um, where it, it it is also weaponized. Um, so this kind of brings me back to uh, voting machines in the polling places. So um, normally when you go to vote, you're not thinking necessarily about um, everything that's led up to that. You're kind of just going in, voting, and then leaving. Um, but the physical security of a polling place and, and how that uh, physical security is carried out is very subjective to uh, that precinct. Um, for example, here in North Carolina, we haven't had a lot of issues with physical security uh, in the political environment impacting that. But uh, in 2020, in Texas, for example, um, each precinct only got one drop box um, per county. And so all of Dallas had one drop box to uh, bring apps, uh, mail in ballots to. And so um, that is a breeding ground for um, all kinds of bad stuff. People can go there and, and wait and, and try to persuade you for, to not vote, um, you know, uh, voter tampering. Uh, you know, this here, for example, uh, security guards have to stand outside of a drop box uh, just to make sure that uh, nothing goes wrong with it. Um, it's it's kind of a bizarre um, circumstance, but everything else that goes along that that election management system that's housed in uh, the polling place, uh, the voting machines, how they count those votes, um, 
those all have to be physically secured and the transmission of those results has to be secured. And then the actual voters. So when you go to vote, um, you know, 2020, if you voted for Biden or Trump, you, you don't want that to come back to haunt you. You don't want your employer to know, uh, you know, so making sure that um, that vote is private is super important because um, without it, uh, in, in a lot of countries that uh, don't implement this, um, you see uh, pay to vote uh, where people are paid to go in and vote because um, they're able to prove that they voted a certain way. Um, and that's not something we want here. Um, on the contrary of this, um, there is actually a researcher that goes uh, he's from the University of Pennsylvania. He Every election, he walks into election sites uh, a couple of days before, follows the signs, say vote here, and just takes selfies with the voting machines unattended uh, in you know local gymnasium or um, the local university. Like um, so, there's there's a lot of work to be done on on this, and, and, and there's a lot of contradictions that happen between what election officials say and what they don't. Um, you know, for example, uh, I'll get into it in some of my, the vulnerabilities that I'll illustrate. But like um, one of the most common things is that election officials say. Um, there is no networked equipment in a system. Um, the whole system is air gapped. And uh, ESNS, for example, we have documentation of over 30 cases where that there are modems or networks in that system where it shouldn't be. Um, North Carolina, again, is very good about preventing this kind of stuff. Uh, like I said, this is Pennsylvania, uh, but it illustrates a little bit of like, uh, you know, every precinct is different, every state is different. Um, and, and that complexity is, uh, kind of led the election to be secure because it's so hard to quantify like a, uh, full campaign, but the farther we get into, uh, the tech era, um, the, the more consolidated, uh, our elections need to be, um, now, election insiders. Um, so the procedural integrity in election oversight. So after you vote, um, there is a whole month long process on counting the votes, tabulating the votes, making sure that the vote counts are right. Uh, your professor uh, can tell you all about that. He works in that area. Um, I think you have some slides that you're gonna talk about that. So I, I won't go into that a whole lot, but um, there are a lot of people involved. Um, and if you have an election insider uh, armed with knowledge on vulnerabilities, for example, from a um, foreign nation uh, that has teams of people that research this kind of stuff, um, that person can be very deadly um, to an election. Uh, this photo here is from uh, a Georgia election official uh, in the blue. Um, I believe she was the head of the Republican Party. She is letting in third party individuals to verify votes uh, who should not be there. Um, and this is part of the ongoing um, uh, Georgia uh, trials uh, right now. Um, but like any kind of procedural vulnerabilities that are there, um, even if you have a secure election from a cybersecurity perspective, uh, there is a social element that can be exploited. Um, if you have, if you don't have transparency on how the system works and accountability on the people in charge, like this, this woman was ultimately held accountable. Um, but you know, if she wasn't like, it could be a different story in Georgia. Um, and then the people that run the elections, you have to be able to train them. Like I said, a lot of them are volunteers. Um, and if, if they aren't in, uh, trained properly on what to do, uh, that in and of itself is a vulnerability. Um, yeah, uh, and then election monitoring, um, uh, you know, the monitoring of the votes, the monitoring of uh, the whole process. Uh, there's lots of people in the rooms when this happens. Um, and if, again, I'll leave that to uh, your professor to go into a little bit more. Um, now, I want to get into um, vulnerabilities that we here at ANT have found in election systems, how those vulnerabilities work within a uh, voting system uh, and why they are really bad. Um, 
So these are the two systems uh, that I've looked at. So ESNS and uh, their express boat system and Dominion, uh, uh, their image cast system. So Dominion are the ones at the center of the Fox News lawsuit. Um, they are the primary uh, voting machine in Georgia. Um, so any kind of news you've heard around those. Uh, Dominion, uh, this is their system. So, um, uh, and, and again, when I go through all of this, um, I am not trying to undermine um, election outcomes of previous elections. These are simply vulnerabilities that we think are there that need to be uh, fixed before uh, the next election. Um, thankfully, with the use of paper ballots, um, all of these vulnerabilities are mitigated uh, through the uh, electoral process. Um, however, the presence of them is still a issue. So um, these, both of these systems, uh, I mean, to summarize this graph, they are very similar. Uh, DRE stands for Direct Recording Electronic. Uh, BMD is Ballot Marking Device. Um, both of them uh, have the ability to print out a paper ballot. Uh, and most of the implementations of them do uh, have a paper backup. Um, so a voting system breakdown. So when you go and vote, uh, these two little guys here in blue, uh, that's you. Um, in North Carolina, when you go and vote, most of the time you don't actually interact with an electronic machine. You just fill out a paper ballot and then you drop it into a counting machine. Um, that counting machine... Um, once those votes are tallied, they are ultimately transferred uh, and counted um, via USB and other methods um, to uh, counting server and authentication and registration server. Um, those those servers also make sure that you are who you are when you go to vote. Uh, those ultimately go out into um, uh, the internet to the uh, central state and county election commissioners um, who uh, are in charge of collecting the state's tally and also manage the state databases. Um, those databases are some of the um, biggest security uh, targets um, because manipulation of those databases um, can really harm uh, the election cycle. Um, if you are not able to verify who your voters are, um, <laughs> you can't really count their votes. Um, now, uh, this graph, this is uh, a breakdown of how Dominion's uh, election management system works. Um, so again, in the top, uh, in the black, you have your voters. Um, they come in and um, interact with the image cast system. So, uh, you know, that electronic voting machine, um, the uh, counting machine, when you are done with that vote that you place your ballot into, um, those uh, that information is transferred into the central election management system um, where the vote is counted and verified. Um, that election management system is also where your re uh, registration as a citizen uh, is stored so that when you check in, um, they can verify that you are indeed the right person. Um, once the uh, counting has happened, it goes out uh, via results out of the air gap system to the results and publication server. And when you watch the news that night, um, that is what you are seeing is the live reporting from that publishing server. Um, the, um, a lot of times based off of that county too, what you're seeing are projections, um, which that is a whole minefield in and of itself. But, um, I'm going to, go into Dominion, the hardware vulnerabilities that we've seen and the software vulnerabilities that we've seen. So um, by and large, uh, the, the worst thing we see in the process is common off the shelf devices. So um, instead of using proprietary software or hardware, um, they're just taking regular computers, wiping them and then placing it into that system. Uh, the printers especially are um, a, uh, the, the amount of vulnerabilities that come with off-the-shelf printers is huge. Um, barcodes on the actual ballots um, 
this, uh, th there's a whole host of vulnerabilities that come with using that barcode. The barcode is compromised. Um, and then the USB stick verification process. So um, USB sticks, uh, I, I had it in, uh, I think two slides ago there. Um, they are used to transfer the data from the counting machine to the tabulation servers in the, the central election management system. Um, USBs in and of themselves are not necessarily bad, but um, there, there's just, I mean, every election or every cybersecurity uh, professional that I have talked to about the use of USBs in a system, uh, they cringe at the idea because it is it is one of the easiest places to insert malware or um, uh, a an exploit of a vulnerability. Um, and, and like I have here, malicious USB um, attackers can exploit any kind of firmware vulnerability in hardware systems via an uh, infected USB drive, even wiping it. Uh, a lot of times the system they say that they wipe it with DBAN uh, doesn't necessarily cover everything. And again, if you go back to that election insider, somebody with the right knowledge, having that USB stick in the process, um, it, it just it's a it's an open door um, that does not need to be there. Um, screen vulnerabilities. Um, the systems in uh, Dominion's actual hardware, uh, they are no longer supported by uh, Samsung. So you have out of date screens uh, being used. Um, and then in the actual hardware, of the counting machines, the FPGA hardware. Um, there are multiple hardware components uh, in there that uh, are questionable. Uh, one of the most concerning is that um, one of the main chips is right next to um, the uh, thermal uh, scanner. And uh, if that system overheats, you could potentially lose all your data. Um, and then software. So. Uh, software is a little harder to quantify as uh, it requires a little bit of speculation based off of hardware vulnerabilities, but uh, any kind of external data sources, so the importing of election data uh, from unvetted sources, uh, again, this could introduce malware and this could happen from uh, precincts not using uh, proper protocols. Um, memory card and security key programming. So uh, some of these systems use a security key, just similar to your Aggie card. Um, to uh, uh, vote. Um, unauthorized access to that system or cloning of those cards uh, could lead to issues. <clears throat> uh, the, the ballot image, so when you uh, put your ballot into um, the counting machine, it also creates an image of that ballot. Again, the barcode, if the barcode is compromised, that can lead to issues with that scanned ballot image. Uh, that's one of the ways that they uh, cross verify um, that the ballot is accurate in auditing. Um, if proper security measures uh, are not around that, those images, just like any um, physical, or sorry, any virtual uh, file can be tampered or compromised uh, by some of the vulnerabilities here. Um, and then the uh, validation and reporting, the client system that that runs on um, uh, has, uh, potential to be compromised if not adequately adequately secured. Um, the central scanner, um, it is directly linked to the central workstation, which if that is compromised, uh, could re result in tampering of vote tallies. And then lastly, um, a lot of these systems run on Android, um, not up-to-date versions of Android, um, out-of-date versions of Android that no longer receive security updates. Um, there are uh, right here, stage fright, web view, and media server. Those are three attack vectors that are known to be able to easily compromise even an air gapped version of these Android systems. Um, so, and, and so, uh, a lot of like in a case like this with Android, uh, ESNS, for example, they, um, a security practitioner in 2005 found a vulnerability in their systems that could be directly compromised. And uh, an audit in 2015 before the 2016 election found that even though ESNS knew that vulnerability was there, had put out a patch for that vulnerability that it had not been implemented for 10 years because the 
uh, election uh, officials at sites across the country were just hitting skip update for a decade. So, um, you know, these vulnerabilities being present is is a huge issue in in any any context. Um, and and a lot of times these companies are private companies because you can't have a publicly traded company running an election. Uh, they'll have a direct result of their stock price. Uh, I mean, imagine the fallout on Dominion uh, if they were a publicly traded company. Uh, it it would have been uh, terrible. Um, but because they're pri private, uh, we're not allowed to, or they have no obligation to really allow third parties in to look at their systems. So a lot of times we're having to take these companies at their word for um, whether they have fixed a vulnerability or a patch. Uh, which is very dangerous. Um, and so this brings me back to um, the, I, I threw this in an earlier slide. These are uh, the vulnerabilities um, on top of that, uh, what I just mentioned, that we see as uh, uh, malicious areas and how they compare in the two systems. So on top of everything I just talked about, um, ESNS, has out of date Windows systems. Uh, so Windows 7 and those Windows 7 systems have default passwords. Um, and then down here, uh, networked components. So uh, I mentioned it earlier, there are over 30 cases of uh, election management systems that are supposed to be air gapped, having network components like a modem or a router in that system that were uh, improperly configured and set up. Um, so the air gap system that is counting the votes is actively on the internet. Um, and then the APIs in some of these systems have weaknesses that can be exploited. Um, and then the risk of remote code execution uh, is also present in ESNS. So those are additional vulnerabilities to uh, the ones I've mentioned, and this is how they compare. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's a lot. Uh, so how do we like start to quantify this. So we have private companies that uh, have vulnerabilities that we're having to essentially take their word for in a lot of cases uh, that are being fixed. So um, one of those systems is a honey net. Um, this is research I'm actively engaged in working on. Um, so what a honey net is, is it, it, you're essentially cloning a system um, as close as you can um, without compromising that system and then inserting vulnerabilities into that system to allow somebody to um, actually gain access to that system. So what this allows us to do is, is if there's vulnerabilities present in a election site, um, we can put this on the front end and we can garner data as uh, attackers are trying to ping um, uh, the system. So we're not, we're not like getting our data on the back end of an attack, we're getting it on the front end. And so we can start to recognize patterns and how attackers are interacting with an election site um, in, in the election network. Um, so this photo here, uh, this is uh, a photo from my lab. Uh, this shows uh, every active honey pot that we have running in that um, honey net um, up on the server system. Uh, I'm running all of these off of virtual machines. Uh, and each of these are running on a separate Docker. Um, those Dockers allow these honey nets or honey pots to run as one big collective honey net. Um, and then we can apply that to an election site. So um, this here uh, is the kind of data that we can get from that. So each of those honey pots, uh, like Cowrie, Caner, Dionea, um, each of those emulate a different system in, a net, uh, in, in the network. Um, and we can get, uh, we can quantify the attacks and, and how those systems are being um, looked at. Um, we can see the country IP. We can see whether that's a malicious IP. Um, we can see the operating system of the attacker. Um, and so stuff like DDoS attacks, um, ransomware, uh, man in the middle attacks, we, we can have, uh, we have patterns that we can look at uh, when that stuff happens to actively deny that or um, uh, shut that down when it happens. Um, this is data that we don't currently have on election sites, and it will allow us to uh, better understand um, 
how we can stop vulnerabilities in these systems. Um, <clears throat> next up, I'm going to kind of talk about a couple different um, theoretical solutions we're, we're looking at for elections. So um, open source elections. So open source in and of itself is, is more of a practice than an implementation. Um, but what it is, is uh, as we work on these systems, um, as we develop solutions in, in newer, more up-to-date um, election management systems, um, it will allow more people to look at it um, and will allow us to make it more secure. For example, when you send a message to your mom and dad or uh, a loved one, there's an encryption that happens with that. You can go online, you can look at that encryption. It does not matter how, that you know how that encryption works down to the letter. It is secure enough that it, um, it holds up on its own. And that is open design principle. So we wanna to get to a place where we, we aren't hiding everything in a safe, like it's a Fort Knox. Um, that doesn't work in security anymore. We have to get to a place where we're designing systems that are so secure that it doesn't matter how much you know about the system, you can't get into the system. Um, most of our modern encryptions work that way. Um, and so what this would allow is we, we'd have more transparency and accountability on elections. It'd be much harder for somebody to subvert an election because we would have much more tangible, much more public data on that election. Um, it would make it more secure. We'd have more researchers, uh, more individuals trying to secure an election, and it actually uh, is easier to implement and it costs less. Um, and so one of the things uh, that I'm excited by, the prospect of end-to-end -end verifiability. So from the second that you cast your ballot to the, uh, for the remainder of time, you can see that that ballot has been cast and you can see that it has been counted. Um, this makes it easier for risk limiting audits ahead of elections and post election audits. Um, and then, so on top of this, um, you know, I, I find this very interesting. Microsoft is actually trying to implement uh, something called election guard, um, where it is, it is a form of this end to end verifiable voting. Uh, but if you take open source, um, combine it with homomorphic encryption, zero knowledge proofs, and distributed ledgers, um, there's a potential solution that we're working on on um, creating a secure and, and verifiable voting system. So I'll go through kind of what all this means. So homomorphic encryption is basically a mathematical encryption that allows you to encrypt data um, and view it without decrypting it. So you could see that there's um, 40,000 votes in uh, Greensboro County for uh, candidate A, but you can't see uh, the individual voters. Um, and that is that is simply based off of that um, encryption type. Then you have zero knowledge proofs. So once the votes have been counted uh, and tallied, um, it would allow one party to prove to another party that they know something without revealing it. So, uh, you know, the Democratic Party could show that they have 50,000 votes, again, without showing <laughs> who voted for those individuals. Um, and then on top of all this, so um, distributed ledgers. So I'm sure all of you have probably heard blockchain. Um, I'm not a huge believer in blockchain for elections. There's not any evidence that it necessarily makes an election more secure. Um, However, distributed ledgers are used um, in a lot of government spaces. And what this would allow um, in conjunction with other systems, uh, such as open source, zero knowledge proofs, um, is more trustworthy um, verification of uh, institutions that are already there. So your local institution, it, uh, your local government, it'd be easier and more secure to verify votes through something like a distributed ledger. Um, and it would, it would essentially just act as the consensus of replicated, shared, uh, and synchronized voter databases. So having talked to like um, individuals that work in election spaces, uh, I talked to one man in Mississippi and they literally have to like go in and hand change uh, uh, people on the, uh, based off of obituaries where somebody has died. Uh, there's an individual that has to go in and physically delete people from registries. Um, 
this would help mitigate that. Um, ballot casting and vote counting, uh, as well as the audibility of those elections um, would be easier on something like a distributed ledger in conjunction with other systems. Um, yeah, so uh, tying all of this together, um, <clears throat> Election security is very, very complicated, um, but uh, this is pretty much everything that I've covered here and how they uh, connect to each other. So you have you have three main areas, <clears throat> excuse me, that impact your election security. You have your cyber threats, the political environment, and manipulation and disruption. So at the very bottom here, you have foreign nations. Um, think of this as like your Russia. So. If Russia is going to try to impact our election security, um, they can target the election infrastructure. Um, they can also weaponize information. Uh, weaponization of information is, uh, by and large, the uh, easiest and, and most effective way they've done this. Um, but they can also impact the political environment um, uh, by putting pressure on the political environment in the U.S. in conjunction with uh, massive uses of malinformation. Uh, it leads to election insiders and election deniers who also impact the political environment and can change procedural integrity and election oversight. Um, it also leads to a lack of standard protocols. There is no federal standard on cybersecurity on elections in the U.S. Um, uh, this is a result of this process. Um, and then down in the bottom left, you have your voter database and your voting machines, as well as the vulnerabilities we've listed. Um, election management system and your state databases. This is all under IT infrastructure. And then that's where we're gonna insert HoneyNets is um, on top of that IT infrastructure to try to mitigate some of those IT vulnerabilities. Um, and then down here with your voting machines, you have your physical security of uh, both your Dropbox security and your voting machine storage. Um, and so that is essentially how everything interplays to impact uh, security of elections. Um, so that's all I have. Um, floor is open for Q&A. Um, I can also provide my email if anybody wants to email me. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, yeah. I'll turn it over to Professor Williams. Or, yeah, go ahead. Sort of like that. Mm -hmm. um, this means you didn't want to see the script that see the person's name. Yeah. And, and the, the, the why would the why would that be important? Why would why would the, that person's name be seen over the internet? Mm -hmm. to explain that. I, I forgot the, the term. No, I think uh I think I was talking about yeah, uh zero. yeah, so zero knowledge proof. So um if when when somebody goes in to vote, um, if if you can prove that uh, you have voted um, for a certain person, uh, it leads to a lot of coercion and uh, pay to vote. So uh, somebody can go down to a, I don't know local church and give everyone a thousand dollars if they can prove that they voted for candidate A. So that that first and foremost is is why you don't want um, somebody's name connected to their vote. Um, where it gets tricky is you have to verify that somebody has voted, yes. right? So um, the voter database, when you go in, um, they verify that uh, who you are. Uh, and then once you cast your ballot and it's been counted, um, the uh, account of who you are doesn't necessarily transfer over with you. Um, you you'll be assigned like a number. You'll be um, vote 2,400. Um, and then that will carry with you in an encrypted form uh, with your ballot. Um, but the people that count the ballots, um, people that verify the votes, they don't see that it's uh, John Richard that voted. Uh, they'll just see uh, candidate 2,400 or not candidate, voter 2,400. That's to protect you. And that's also to anonymize the process um, to prevent issues like that. Is that? That's because the name has to be yeah, yeah. You, you have to separate the vote from the person for their safety, uh, ultimately. Um, it, yeah. So. Um, so 
it doesn't necessarily need to be open source. Right now, it is closed off. Um, the process of make uh, or the practice of making it open source it allows more people to um, uh, check vulnerabilities and find vulnerabilities and patch them. Um, like your thanks, um, Yeah. Oh. One of the advantages of open source is that people can see the source code of the program mm -hmm. and determine. Many experts look at it and determine is it secure or not. When you have proprietary, we're all hoping these companies built trustworthy software and they're not changing the votes, but take their word for it. If you have open source, you can have all sorts of people looking at the code and determining whether it is in fact secure or not yeah. or fair. Yes, another question. Open source. Often, yes. Yeah. If you Think of like GitHub or something kind of, it's not exactly that, but yes, you can make a branch, make some changes, and then they decide whether they're going to merge your changes back into the product. Uh, so there's still a bit of CDP and enabled. So it's not like anybody can do it. Oh, no, uh, yeah. yes. Uh, anybody can provide a uh, change, but it doesn't mean it gets incorporated. Yeah, no, that's that was excellent. That was, you summed it up better than I could. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, w when it comes to open source, it's not just anybody off the street. Uh, like you're saying, like um, a lot of resource uh, research that uh, we do at the PhD level, like um, we'll do peer reviewed research where that is open source, but it's open source to the academic community. So it, it might be paywalled or or protocol walled off. Um, yeah. Any other questions? Any questions online? Well, okay. Well, hearing none, uh, we'll move on. Oh, Sorry, we do have a question. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, how will adding ID verification complicate the voting process? Like, I know pretty much what you talked about is like just, oh. just like this electronic. Yeah. Well, I'm going to talk with... about that in just a few minutes. Yeah. Okay. Good. Good question. I have another like an extra. Go ahead. So, okay, so this today is, uh, it's still, it's still some, like the voting on the regular level seems to be outdated. Why can't it, like a person can vote on their phone or on their own person? Yeah, uh, I mean, the thing with technology is like, um, you know, most of the uh, nuclear um, complex it runs on technology from like the 70s um, because the newer technology is the more issues and vulnerabilities you that can be in, inserted so um, to have everyone voting on their phone you have to like be able to show that that environment is going to be secure enough and you can't really do that with like just an app or, or in a way that's going to be practical so um, that's why we still have paper ballots because at the end of the day I mean it, it's very hard to manipulate a paper ballot uh, we have we have electronic systems built around those ballots, but um, just a like a direct recording electronic where there's no paper ballot, it's just electronic and at a polling site. Um, you know, if if that digital signature of the votes gets lost, there's no backup, uh, and that that's that's a big part of it is the backup. Um, how do you make sure that uh, we don't lose the vote count? You know, if you lose one precinct's vote count in a in a let's say Georgia, like uh you could literally overturn an election and that's so that's actually a scenario um i just want to touch on too uh with all of this like um in order to um or how can all of this be put together to actually compromise an election um you don't have to switch the whole votes of an entire state but if you take one or two precincts uh, georgia is a great example very small vote count uh determined who won in 2020 um, if you create a scenario where there's vulnerabilities that are exploited to where there's a discrepancy, um, what will happen is the state will end up sending two uh, slates of legislatures. Uh, those slates of legislatures are from each party to Washington um, when they verify the vote. And that's what all those people were there uh, to uh, uh, try to stop from happening on January 6th. Um, but two slates of legislatures go to uh, Washington, the, um, 
the U.S. Congress is going to send those back to the state to decide uh, in that scenario. And then if you have election insiders and, and people in certain places or in that state who um, can basically have the say at that point, uh, you could essentially flip an entire state's vote um, just from some discrepancies in the voting machines in one uh, precinct in a state. Um, so uh, it's really important that these get addressed for that reason. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank well, thank you very yeah. much. Okay, I'm going to go over a little bit about how elections work uh, in Guilford County, the county here where we are right now at A&T. Uh, in addition to my role as the professor for this class, I happen to be a chief judge for a precinct in my neighborhood. So I help run the elections uh, well in November and primaries and other elections that we might have. Might point out that there are no elections in Greensboro and Guilford County, except for certain towns. Some uh, Summerfield and some other uh, towns are having elections on November 7th, next Tuesday. But in general, no, there are no elections in Guilford County. Um, <clears throat> okay, there are requirements for elections. We all know that you have to be a citizen, you gotta be old enough to vote. You have to be registered to vote. That is, you have to tell the election system that you are here, that you are a citizen, provide documentation that you are eligible, and so you get on the voting rolls. Uh, note that your vote has to be secret. When you vote, nobody knows how you voted. They have to know that you did vote because that way they can keep you from voting twice. Although it shouldn't be available to others that you, oh, people can tell that you voted. I was the uh, parties, the political parties, the Republicans or Democrats can come by to a precinct and look at who has voted. That is allowed, but they don't see how you voted. Uh, and of course, Every vote is supposed to count. So you have to make a system that provides all these features. Uh, here in North Carolina, a couple of things to note. Uh, so far, nobody successfully attacked, or nobody knows that they've successfully attacked any of the election systems. We use paper ballots. It is a paper ballot. When we hand them a ballot, it's just a fill in the circle, or should fill in the little circles, just like you do for exams. Uh, we, give them a, we give them a ballpoint pen and we tell them that that ballpoint pen has been carefully checked and it hasn't been uh, attacked by any foreign adversary. That is just a ballpoint pen. <laughs> they fill in their circles and then they scan them. I'll go over that. Uh, all the systems certified. There are no network connections on the equipment. Uh, just logically, they do post-election audits. They have trained officials. By the way, the election officials in your precinct are paid. Now, we are not going to get very wealthy uh, at the rates they're paying us, but they do pay us a little bit, make a couple hundred bucks working the elections. It is a 14 hour day. So it's a, a long day working the elections. And, okay. Might point out there are 50 states and each state has lots of counties and each county has lots of precincts. There's at least 100,000 polling places in the United States. And I might point out they're different. One of the strengths of the US polling system, US voting system, is that it's haphazard and different in every place. And even though you might be able to figure out how to attack one county in North Carolina, then that only gets you into one county. It's going to be different in other counties, it's going to be different in other states. So it's very different. That makes it difficult for somebody to, if we had one centralized voting system, if you talk about the advantage of having an open source and having everybody use that open source, well, that's good. But then somebody figure out how to get in, they can get in everywhere. Now it's all different. Uh, in Guilford County, we use paper ballots. The machines are then read into a, a, a vote counting machine. Vote counting machines are isolated and, well, we'll go on about it. Yes. Okay. Uh, here in Guilford County, Charlie Collicott is the director of the Guilford County Board of Elections. Uh, and uh, Craig Fox, a friend of mine, is also a member of that. 
there are 134 polling places in Guilford County. So it's quite a diverse operation and rather large. You have to register to vote. You uh, have to be, you, have, you can register, well, ahead of time, I'll talk about that. But you have to either register at the Board of Elections downtown at the Count Corny Howe House, or you can uh, register at the De Department of Motor Vehicles when you go to get your license. Uh, or you can register by mail. So there's multiple ways to register, but you must be registered. Now, on early voting, there's a, there is election day, which is next Tuesday, the first Tuesday in November. Um, you, can let, you can vote then, or in North Carolina, you can vote a couple of weeks early. On the early voting, you can register the same day. In other words, you can walk in, having never registered, register and vote there. You cannot early vote, excuse me, you cannot same day register on election day. On election day, you have to uh, be registered ahead of time. You can early vote if you're not registered. You can walk in, register, and early vote, right? All of but on election day, for I don't know why, I don't make this, I just know how it works. No, you have to be registered. Uh, I haven't done any clicker questions today. I'll just tell you that the answer to this one is no, you cannot be, dead people can't vote. The uh, vital records office uh, communicates with the voting people. So if you die, they tell the voting people that you are dead and so you can't vote. Uh, that's kind of important because that had been something in the past. We'll talk about Chicago for a, a minute because everybody everybody picks on Chicago of a hundred years ago where a lot of dead people voted. It was, and also not about a hundred years, 125 years ago, when you voted, they gave you a receipt that you voted and it was what party you voted for. Now that receipt was good in certain taverns. You could go down if you brought the right receipt to the right tavern, you could get yourself a beer and a sandwich. Of course, if you walked into the wrong tavern with that receipt, you'd probably get yourself beat up. But uh, yes, but it had an impact on voting. Now votes are secret. Okay, when you walk into the voting uh, precinct here in Guilford County, they will ask you for an ID. Previously, they did not ask for ID. Uh, and a lot of people wanted to show us ID, but they had to tell them, no, we don't need ID. Now we've changed the rules, IDs are back in. Uh, you can get IDs from all sorts of locations, and they accept a wide variety of IDs. But you have to have one of the acceptable IDs, usually driver's license, although there are others. Uh, university ID will work. Uh, I might point out it is a felony to misrepresent yourself. We always used to tell people that when they said, we well, don't need ID. I said, yes. And I remember one joker said, well, okay, I'm this guy. I said, all right. You say you're that guy, sign your name here. Now, if you sign your name and you're not that guy, I can challenge you. And if you're wrong, you've committed a felony, you'll probably go to jail. That kind of, say, well, maybe I won't be that guy. <laughs> okay, so uh, when you tell us who you are and you have to speak your name out loud because voting observers need to know, then we will look through a big three ring book, notebook that we have for your name. And when we find your name, there's a sticker. It's a adhesive sticker. We peel off the adhesive sticker with your name. And we might have to ask the person for their address because some names appear multiple times. And then we stick that, your name, onto an ATV, an authorization, authorization to vote form. It's a piece of paper, oh, about six by six inches. And we stick it on there. Uh, and you have to sign it saying that, yes, you are this person. Uh, then, then you take that authorization to vote form and you give it to another uh, person, another election worker. That election worker will then give you the paper ballot and uh, a pen. Now, I might point out if you're doing a primary, in primaries, you have to vote for a party on general General elections, no, you, you don't have to specify what party you vote for, and you can vote any way you want. If you are a registered Democrat, you're certainly allowed to go and vote for a Republican. 
There's no vote for anybody. On a primary, though, a primary is different. A primary is an election run by that party, in a sense. And so if you are a Democrat, you can only vote for the Democratic primaries. You cannot vote in the Republicans. And the other way around for both. If you are an independent, and here in North Carolina, about a third of the people are Democrats, a third of the people are Republicans, and a third of the people are unaffiliated or independent voters. If you're an independent voter, you come in and you tell them what party you want to vote for. Do you want to vote in the Democratic or Republican primaries? Uh, I might also mention there's the Constitution Party and the Green Party in North Carolina, and you can always work and participate in those parties. They are a little bit smaller than the other two. Um, and then after you've got your ballot, the proper ballot, and I might also mention that some precincts overlap political boundaries so that this half his precinct might be in the city limits and half the precinct might be outside the city limits. So you get different ballots. Also for those people who are 18 years old that were not 18 years old when they registered, but now they're 18, they have, it's complicated. They also have separate ballots. Uh, then you often you fill in the little circles for who you want to vote for. Hopefully you do it right. And then you run your ballot through uh, a ballot counting machine. Uh, the ballot counting machine will make sure that you voted uh, only once for each candidate, or excuse me, sometimes you're allowed to vote for two or three candidates for particular positions, and they'll check that. But if you mis mismark your ballot, it will give you the option. So well, we can either skip that particular race. In other words, if you were voting for dog catcher and you voted for twice for dog catcher, there's no, that's not, you have the option of saying, no, just drop my vote for dog catcher, or it will spit back your ballot and you can get a, a new ballot and then mark again. By the way, when you spit back your ballot, that, that once marked ballot has to be voided. Uh, as chief judge, I had to take the ballot, write void on it, take, you know, go, fill out several forms and put that ballot in a pile. Because at the end of the day, I have to account for every ballot we got initially. I was a Give us a number of ballots to start with, we count the ballots. And at the end, we count the ballots, we have to count everyone that went in the machine, everyone that didn't go in the machine, everyone that was voided, and whatever we did with them. Now, at the end of the day, when everybody's done, uh, then we have to close the polls. We uh, go to the counting machine and we enter the instructions saying, close the polls. There is a USB port on the machine. Uh, you have to break a seal, open it with a key, which I, as chief judge, carry around the keys and I can open the port. And then there's a USB. I put the USB in there and it will write to the USB with the results election. It also writes a paper result of the election. It does the paper result twice. The two of the judges have to sign the paper result. So that saying that's valid. Oh. We also take all the paper ballots that we that are on the bottom of the machine. We stuff those into boxes. We seal the boxes with the official seals, sign the seals saying that, yes, two judges have seen that these are all the ballots and we haven't marked up the ballots since we got them out of the machine. The paper ballots that were, or the results that were printed out by the machine and signed by the judges. One of them goes downtown that night along with the USB. The chief judge, which is me, takes all the boxes of, of ballots, takes the USB and the paper ballot, and takes it downtown and drops it off with the election people there. Another copy of the paper of the results is given to another judge who will then put it in an envelope and mail it by US mail the next day to the downtown. So it's going there by two processes so they can check it. Uh, the voting machines have to be programmed for that particular ballot. It's a hat to know if you put a little mark here on the page, what does that mean? Are you voting for president? Are you voting for dog catcher? What are you voting for? And so they have to be put. The, uh, they are programmed by the Board of Elections people. Charlie Calicut and his uh, workers do that themselves. There is no third party involved. Uh, the machines that they use to do this are locked up in a vault when they're not being used. They have no network connections. Uh, 
And when we start the machines early in the morning, they have to be uh, the voting count machines. We have to enter a password to get them started. After it's all done, and the ballot is all done, the folks downtown at the election headquarters or the board of elections have all the paper ballots, all the boxes that we brought back and sealed, and they have the USBs and they have the paper. And then they try to verify that they're correct. They will scan some of the paper ballot results and see if they match what's on the USB. And they'll take, for some randomly selected precincts, they'll take all the paper ballots that we got and they'll run them through the machine and see what the counts match what the counts that we gave them to see that in fact they are correct. They don't do it for all the ballots because it's a whole lot of ballots in this county. Uh, they, of course, give the press a copy of the results as soon as they know. And there's also people who are asking as you walk out, how did you vote? So that the press can get an idea how people voted. Um, the election officials have to report the ballot results in 10 days. There's a day, 10 days after the ballot, after they've done all their audits, then they post the results officially. At the polling places, you can have poll observers. That poll observer has to be authorized in order to be there. They're authorized by the political parties. The political parties, the Republicans and the Democrats, may say, I want to send a poll observer to this polling place. Here is the person who will be. And then the Board of Elections will tell me, as the chief judge at my precinct, who is going to show up as a poll observer. Now, there are poll observers assigned to particular precincts, and there's also a couple poll observers that can wander around from precinct to precinct. But not just anybody can do this. You have to be an authorized poll observer. The poll observers can they watch. They can't take any pictures. They can't not see how people are voting. They have to stay far away from where people are actually voting. But they can be next to the table where you come in and say your name. One of the reasons why you have to say your name, you just can't point say your name out loud so the poll observer can say yes i believe that person is who they say they are so if you come in and say you're mickey mouse you want to vote as mickey mouse that day and mickey mouse happens to be on the rolls the uh, the poll observer can say i don't think you're mr mouse uh, and uh, and challenge you uh, again can't speak can't disrupt uh, well okay but they are organized by the parties I can say I'm grateful. I've never had any poll observers at my precinct. Long ago, for those of the gray beards, you might remember these machines were not electronics. They hadn't invented all the electronics yet. <laughs> so it was all mechanical. When you went in to vote, you pushed down these little levers they have there and who you wanted to vote for. Uh, you, when, you came into the poll, when you came into the voting booth, you grab that great big lever there and you yank it over to the other side and that closed the curtain and enabled the switches. You clicked all the switches. And then when you're done, you push that lever over that recorded them into the counters in the machine and open the curtain. And so you are curtained off. And if somebody had a question, they could lean out of the curtain and get one of the poll workers to come over and help something. Uh, here in America, you can also vote by mail in many places that chain it differs in different uh, states. And there's lots of rules, and that's been a big question of concern about how are these ballots checked? How do you know that that really is that person? And who can pick them up? Can people go around the neighborhood and pick up all the absentee ballots or not? Some places say you must turn them in yourself or, or mail if there is. Yes, here's how the laws vary in different states, you can see. And again, absentee by ballot is... In 2020 election, about 40% of all the ballots were, now remember we had a uh, pandemic going on there that did have an impact. Uh, it's changed over the years, you can see, voting methods have changed, uh, actually being there on election day was most of it, then early elections have been more and more, uh, last precinct, 26% of the people voted early voting. Uh, so that was almost the same as uh, voting election day, but by mail, by there were more people voting by mail than anything else. Uh, we're going to skip that today. Um, but some people say, oh, we ought to hand count those ballots. Well, think about that for a minute. Uh, in the 2022 ballot election, that was the one a couple of years ago, there were 19 races on that piece of paper. In other words, there were people running for president, 
uh, president, people from running for governor, people running for senators, congressmen, uh, mayors, and congress and councilmen, and dog catchers, and soil and water conservation people. Uh, and so lots of them, you have to count each one of those. There were over a quarter million ballots out there. Uh, uh, that's going to take a heck of a long time to count them by hand. Also, I might point out humans are human. Excuse me? Human errors. Humans are not real good at counting. Uh, you think it's simple. You think every school child could do that, but you do it a lot. Yes, we have a question. Uh, probably remember the 2000 border recount. Uh, oh. But they were, they were literally hand counting them with magnifying glasses. It took like an hour to go through like 20 ballots. Uh, uh, law, yes. Uh, Al, Al Gore and George Bush had an election. It was down to Florida. Uh, Florida was it was really close, and their election system was miserable. They had these cards that you punched holes in. Uh, uh, they were they had pre well pre punched holes. You could push through the holes. They were uh, almost cut through, but you could push them through. I've I used it for research before. They're miserable. They fall apart. The little things fall. Hanging chads was the key words. There are little chads that fall out and they stick. Uh, anyway, it made a mess of everything. So, in my opinion, in your person, hand counting is not going to work. Oh, I was going to ask you a question about that, but we are, we're out of time. Uh, it's just not going to go. Foreign elections, we'll skip that. Uh, two parties. In North Carolina, almost all the elections are two parties or two candidates. There are some where nobody's running. But then there are a few places where multiple candidates are out there. And there are many ways to do that, which we will not talk about. Do anybody have any questions about this? I was going to show you more events too. Well, you've got some conversation. There's some changes. And the standards grow. Well, here in North Carolina, again, remember we are just marking in circles. Yeah, we fill it here. It's like those exams you get. We fill in the little circle. That's what they're doing for the for how you want to vote. Mark industry. And it's not just a big piece of paper. They it's printed. This pre, this person or that person. Mark here. Okay. Uh, so it's so it's just paper. And it's pretty hard to, you know, to fake the paper. Also, they can go back and look at the paper and check and count, recount the paper by machine. But they can have a separate machine recounted. Okay. Any other questions? Then that's it. We'll be back on Monday to talk about malware. Uh, do please read the section of the textbook on malware. Here. Uh,